Welcome to today's session on treating hard to heal wounds, an evidence-based approach for DFU and chronic wounds. Uh, these are definitely exciting times, uh, working with all of you, with Wounds Canada, with government, and all of our clinical and non-clinical stakeholders. Um, I'm personally very excited to be here. I am a type 1 diabetic myself. I've been living with the condition for over 30 years. So thank you to all of you for what you do, uh, because it matters to me very much. I also have the privilege of being the <clears throat> general manager for Integral Life Sciences. And Integral Life Sciences is dedicated to this therapy space. Um, we've definitely grown very quickly. Recently, we've acquired Derma Sciences, which many of you know. We've also acquired Codman Neurosurgery from J&J. &J. This helps us bring relevant scale as we talk with all of you and with everyone who helps your lives in terms of treating patients with diabetes. So on that note, we are very pleased that Dr. Friedman is here with us today. Dr. Friedman is a fellowship trained foot and ankle specialist and holds an appointment to the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at New York Presbyterian Columbian University Medical Center and the Department of Surgery at New York Presbyterian uh, Wheel Cornell Medical Center. He has been the podiatry captain for the TCS New York Marathon since 2008 and is a president of the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons. Dr. Friedman received his doctorate from the New York College of Pediatric Medicine. He was chief resident at the Mount Sinai Hospital Podiatric uh, Surgery Residency Program and completed a fellowship in reconstructive foot and ankle surgery and research at the Well Foot and Ankle Institute in Chicago. Dr. Friedman is a board certified uh, by the American uh, Board of Podiatric Surgery. He is a fellow of the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons. The list goes on, but uh, in the interest of time, I'll stop there. I will share, though, that Dr. Friedman is a noted expert in the field of diabetic wounds, regenerative medicine, and reconstructive foot surgery. He has authored scientific papers on reconstructive foot and ankle surgery, diabetic wound healing, and tendon injuries. He's lectured nationally and internationally, and we're very pleased that he's here with us today. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Friedman. Good morning, everybody. Okay, Paul, I, I, I wish my mom would have heard that. She was very proud. <laughs> um, okay, so today um, we have a little bit of time. I'm gonna try to make sure that we have some uh, time for questions um, afterwards. Um, and I'm also gonna be here afterwards. If you wanna come by and talk to me, I'll be here. I'm leaving a little bit later today. Um, okay, so full disclosure, I am getting paid to be here today. Um, this is what we really don't see, right? We don't see acute normal wound healing, but in order to understand the pathology of what an abnormal wound is, you really have to understand what normal wound healing is, right? And it's very orderly and timely, and it's predictive, right? It goes through three general phases of inflammation, proliferation, and remodeling, and then you basically get a regenerated tissue that's very similar, if not exactly the same, as what we had beforehand. And we're familiar with this progress of this normal wound curve, and that, that one phase starts, and then the other one starts while the other one's still going on, and it's a reparative phase, and we're very um, well aware of this one, right? And standard wound management for any, for any wound, basically, is these, these uh, six things. Wound bed preparation, controlling any of the infection, if we have any problems with ischemia, we have to control that, right, because it doesn't really matter if you have no flow going to the area, it doesn't matter. It's like a, it's a plumbing problem, right? If you have a problem with the toilet, you, you don't just necessarily, when you have a plumbing issue, you don't go and fix the toilet, you fix the plumbing. So we have to make sure that that's there. Um, nutritional repletion, a lot of these people just do not have the appropriate proteins in their, in, their, in their diets, their albumin levels are low, and if we don't have the building blocks for that, it doesn't really matter as well. You have to make sure that their A1Cs are not Olympic. Uh, I call the Olympic A1C where you're actually trying to win something. Uh, and uh, we want to get sure that. And the same thing is offloading. We'll have to talk a little bit about offloading in general uh, a little bit today. Um, just a little bit more on wound bed preparation. Um, the dime mnemonic is always something that's in our head um, for debridement for removing infection and inflammation, controlling for moisture, and as well as for edge advancement, making sure that you don't have any epiboly or that 
wound kind of like migrates in because once epithelium sees epithelium, they think that they're done and then they stop healing. So we always have to re and uh, refresh that wound as well. So this is a little bit of a schematic of what normal wound healing happens. And um, if you look at, um, I'm going to kind of point a little bit out here. But, oops, but um, normal wound healing, let's say we, we created a, a wound, a deep dermal wound here that went through the epidermis and into the, and into the dermis. What happens is granulation tissue forms. Fibroblasts kind of come in and they, they get into that, into that section and they start to differentiate into different types of cells. One of the cells that it actually differentiates it is a very special cell called a myofibroblast. And myofibroblasts are important because what they do is they contract the wound. And it actually starts to contract that wound. But, so the good thing is, is you have a wound contraction, but the bad thing is, is that when you, have a, when you have wound contraction, what you're also getting is scar tissue. And about 10 to 30% of that wound has some scar tissue due to these myofibroblasts. Again, it's what we want done, and this is by healing by secondary intention, right? Where we're not suturing something together, but we're letting granulation happen, secondary intention healing. But what we also know about scar tissue is that it's not the same thing, right? Scar is not the same thing as regenerated tissue, right? That's why if you have, let's say, a plantar wound on the foot, underneath, let's say, one of the metatarsal heads, and it's healed with a scar, what do we know about that? We know that that scar is not as flexible. We know that there's a stiffness coefficient that's, that's, that's part of it. And that's also one of the reasons why we get re-ulcerations in the same place, because scar tissue is not regenerated tissue. And it's very important to understand this. Our body can regenerate something, but it can't regenerate it fully. And our goal is basically to replace like with like. Right? If we can do that, we're golden. And we happen to live in, 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 in a time where medicine is going towards that in terms of regeneration to replace life with life. I get this question every single day. Doc, when is my wound going to heal? Right? I'm sure you hear the same thing. When's my wound going to heal? And I say it's going to heal and it's going to heal. That's basically it. We're going to see you until it kind of heals. But it, it depends on certain things. It depends on fibroblasts going and migrating into that area the extracellular matrix being deposited, and then keratinocytes and skin cells filling in, and myofibroblasts contracting that wound. So, so it depends on this type of process. Now, unfortunately, with chronic wounds, we do not have that, right? This is, it's not organized, and we kind of get stuck in that inflammatory phase. And because we get stuck in that inflammatory phase, we end up seeing um, the wounds which we see right now. Now, I pride myself on what I do with my patients. I always say, well, I think I probably do a better job. Forget about a better job. I think I do a very good job in treating my patients. I, I, I feel proud about what I do. And standard of care, what we did before, that dime mnemonic, it is surprising that if all you do is that, at 12 weeks, about 25% 20, about, about of those people will be healed. And at 20 weeks, you get about 30% healed. So unless you're a baseball player, those numbers stink, right? Let's just say, if I did any kind of my reconstructive surgeries, I put in implants and I do all this stuff, and I had 50% of my patients healing, I would look for another job, right? But somehow, somehow in our field of wound healing, if we heal something 50%, we give each other high five. Isn't that weird? Right, I think that you know, weird, like, like you're congratulating yourself for doing an okay job, not for doing a great job. So what I try, again, it, for me, what I try to do is, I try to get those odds on my side. So we'll talk about a couple of things that can help us improve some of these rates. But standard of care, although you do want to start with standard of care, understand that standard of care does not do fantastic. So in lots of men analysis, about 50% of these ulcers fail to heal with, reg with regular standard of care. So again, if you get a little bit more aggressive with these early on, knowing, knowing that, maybe you know some other social factors that are kind of coming into play, or if you know historically this person needed a little bit more help, it may want you to try to initiate something a little bit earlier. This is Peter Sheehan's fa famous study, which, um, which what he did was he said, well, if you're doing, you, you should expect about 50% of wounds to heal, 
right, by within four weeks. And if, if, if that's what happens, there's a predictive value that that wound's gonna go ahead and heal. It's just a different way to kind of read these numbers. But if it doesn't heal, it has about a 9% chance of healing at, at, uh, um, at three months. So that's why when we do, when we do our, our um, treatments, we always will reevaluate them at four weeks and see, do we need to do a paradigm shift? Um, did we cross all our keys and dot all our eyes? Did we do everything we needed to do? Did we take care of, of the wound bed? Did we prepare it correctly? Did we uh, make sure that there's moisture balance? Did we offload them? And then if that doesn't work, then that becomes that challenging wound, that hard to heal wound. And then therefore you should probably change your, um, your uh, paradigm. I will tell you, I start even earlier than that, because I don't even wait for four weeks, because those first four weeks are golden. Right? You don't want to wait for those first four weeks. So I'm a little bit more aggressive than maybe some other people are because I don't want to lose time on that stuff. Because again, 50% for me, I think that stinks. Right? So what's the pathways to non-healing? Before we talk about pathways to healing, let's talk about why, wouldn't, why does this wound stay chronic? Well, sometimes there's, again, vascular insult. There's infection that's in that area. Biofilm, we just heard a nice talk about on that. Um, the wound, the wound um, conditions are hostile. These things have all these enzymes inside that just break stuff down consistently. Um, nutritional deficiency and there's pressure on that wound. So what can we do for each of these, these um, impediments to healing? So for offloading, uh, for trauma and, and, uh, and pressure, we can offload these patients. We can revascularize them if they have a, some kind of vascular insult. For infection, for biofilm, we can treat that with debridements, with topicals, with antibiotics. For these hostile wound conditions, we can also use some advanced dressing and some tissue-based products and control them nutritionally as well. So, you're going to see this slide again, because this is the gut check. This is how I, I look at it, I do a gut check in the morning, right? If all my factors are addressed and corrected, and the wound is not healing at that reasonable rate that we just talked about, then what we need to do is we need to start considering advanced wound therapy. So if you're gonna say, you know, I really wanna see how that SOC, how that standard of care works, that's fine, but then do that four week gut check or earlier if that's what you need to do for yourself. And if you feel that that wound is ready um, because it's just not gonna heal, then I encourage you to start initiating some of these things. So what is advanced wound care? Advanced, there's a physical component of advanced wound care, which would be, well, we're gonna talk about total contact casting. There's a biophysical component of hyperbaric oxygen and negative pressure. There are growth factors where you can use platelet-rich plasma and platelet-derived growth factor as well. And extracellular matrices like Integra, which is really near and dear to me. But first we'll start with offloading. So, not all offloading is the same, right? Um, in fact, uh, I was probably one of the biggest detractors we'll ever meet uh, on offloading with total contact casting. I didn't even admit it. Uh, and the reason is, is I live in Manhattan. I live in New York City, and I have never seen somebody go in the subway with total contact cast. And I ask people when I do, I said, have you anybody ever seen you in total contact cast? And no one's like, no. And the reason is, is you cannot get around New York City in a total contact cast. Um, and the reason was they're heavy. There's liability issues about like going down steps and falling and cracking, right? And you're like walking on this little kind of kind of peg, it, and, and and just time issues and space issues from where we have. And so I'd never seen it, but yet the data really shows, and I'll, and I'll show you in a little bit that that's the best way to offload a patient. So if I'm proud of like the way I'm going and treating my patients, how could I not do this for them? Well, I didn't do it for them because I thought it was bad. Like I was more worried about them breaking their hips and their heads rather than not healing their wounds. But so I would offload them in a cam boot, in a four foot wedge shoe, which I showed you beforehand, and maybe a post-operative shoe with a cutout or something of that nature. But there's no real good data to show that those are great ways to offload these patients. This is really the gold standard. There's a, there's a uh, you see on your, on. The left-hand side here uh, is a standard total contact cast with that little like wedge thing, which if any of you have done, that is not an easy thing to do. I mean, I used to do these long before in my training. You'd do it with plaster and try to get them into that right space, and you'd have four people with slow-setting plaster, and it took 45 minutes, and it weighed about 25 pounds, and they're horrible. And when those things, you, you also worry about re-ulceration in these areas, and like 
getting people on rocker bottoms. And it was a very, very difficult thing to go ahead and do. So I remembered that experience. And I said, there's no way when I go into private practice, I'm never going to do this. Um, and then there's, on the other side, the PCC Easy, which has really kind of changed my, my um, perspective on this and has really become a gold standard in my practice. And again, I really want to stress to you, I was the other person, okay? I was the other person because I just did not, not that I didn't believe in the therapy, I didn't believe that that was something that I could manage in my practice. So how does a TCC work? And this is just some general stuff. How does a regulatory contact cast work? Well, first of all, it reduces any of the shearing forces uh, uh, to, um, to the foot. Um, it also removes, because their ankle is locked, the propulsive phase of them actually pushing off. So as far as metatarsal ulcer, ulcers, those kind of go away. And the other thing is, is that it works like a boat, you know, like, or like a ship like in the ocean. It, it, it basically uses a whole leg to offload that area so you're not getting a pinpoint uh, area of force. Yeah. Okay. Now, again, gold standard, papers out there. This is a seminal paper that was by, by Armstrong that said that about 90% of DFUs can be healed with total contact cast. 90%! Nothing I do is 90% ever. And, but there's like over, over, and that's over six weeks. And that's, that's amazing. Now, I'm not going to tell you six weeks, but I will tell you that it's not that far off of that. Um, there are consensus papers that have showed that, that basically total contact casting is the, is the most preferred way to offload. A, uh, offload. Here in Ontario, new, um, new guidelines that basically say that total contact casting or removable total contact casting or something like that is the preferred way to be offloading these patients and that there is a huge health benefit for that. So there, again, I have to tell you, again, my problems wasn't with the, the tech, was, was more with the application uh, and the social components of it rather than saying, oh, I don't believe total contact casting works. You can't, I'm not going to say that, that's for sure not. But when this system kind of came about, when Dermasciences and now Integra kind of came about, I said, let me go ahead and try it. And the ease of putting this thing on, and, and, and I'm going to tell all of you to come by and think tomorrow uh, and the booth, they're actually going to have demos for this over the weekend. It, it's quick. I do this by myself. I don't have any assistance. I literally do this all alone. And it takes me about seven or eight minutes to put one on, and then I let it dry for a couple of minutes. It is, it's all self-contained. It's two sizes. It's really, really easy to put on. And, um, and the, the difference here is, is that after you put this on, you then put them into a specialized hand boot that has these crampons on the side. So what you're doing is, is now you've eliminated that difficulty of walking. There's a little bit of a rocker in there. And you have seen their gait. And their gait is fairly normal after they're walking. Now, they don't have the same kind of stride length. But when you're walking around with that, you know there's stability that's involved. And they can actually go on and have a productive life, rather than having something which is 30 pounds and becomes a liability. And if you see it by yourself, you'll do it. So let me show you the case that changed my mind, OK? And it wasn't my case, but it was my patient. So I had sent somebody, one of my patients, who is a type 2 diabetic transplant patient. He had a heel ulcer. I did all this stuff for him. I gave him a cam boot. He failed in crutches. I did 10 grafts on him. Split thickness skin graft. I did a, a vac. I did a rotational slap on him. Right? And I did everything that in plastic surgery that you can do for this guy. He needed hyperbarics, and it, I didn't want him to come to, my, to come to my office, so I found the place that was next to him. There was a new clinician who had literally just graduated his residency. He said, this is the worst boom I've ever seen. I'm going to show it to you. It's not the worst boom I've ever seen, right? <laughs> it's not the worst boom I've ever seen, but he's like, this is the worst I've ever seen. He put total contact casting on him, and in a, in a period of six months, was able to get this thing closed. Now, again, brand new practitioner, me, right? Now I'm like supposed to be the fancy guy, right? So I couldn't get this thing closed in years. And I said, what the hell? And he's like, well, I couldn't even do hyperbarics on the guy because there was a problem with his ear. So I just put him in total contact. And I said, you got him closed in a total contact? Really? And he said, yeah. He's like, I put this thing on. And I was like, wow. So I had him come back to me. Unfortunately, what happened is, is, that, is that after a certain amount of time, he just went, went right back to his regular footwear and he re -ulcerated. I said, oh my god, 
I'm totally going to do this. So I called him up and I said, give me one of the same system. And so I put him in there and then, and then, and then basically within two months I was able to close him there. And then I realized, what's the mistake? The mistake was he went back to his regular shoes. So now, actually, what I do is, when they're closed, and right when they're closed, I have the orthotists come and measure them for an, uh, uh, ankle foot orthosis with a locked ankle. And then this way, they'll go into their, their regular type of um, diabetic shoe. And I, you always keep them in that total contact cast for an additional two weeks so that new baby skin to mature. And then once they're ready to go out there, that, that orthotic is ready, the orthosis is ready, and then they're able to go back into life. And now he's maintained closure. So he's maintained closure for the last six months. I've done this for all my patients. Now let me show you. I said, okay, let me do it on my patients. Right? So here's the second case. So I'm going to show you like super hard cases. Diabetic, end stage renal on dialysis for five years. He had a fifth ray resection. He has these wounds for three years. Here he goes. I'm the failure here. He failed. I'm not going to he failed. I failed. Cam boots, five biologics, split thickness skin grafts, back. Again, everything plastic surgery under the sun. Here are his wounds, right? So I, just, I started going ahead and putting, putting him in the TCC easy. And these are serial. These are my pictures. I take them weekly. And then closed, right? So let's go back here for a second. Closed. I mean, this is like this guy's a nightmare. I mean, I know him personally also. He's a nightmare person. So, I mean, it's, this is, and, and, and so I said, oh my God, like, this is going to work. Right? I said, okay, let me show you another one. So, here's a guy who has a BKA on the right, on the, on the left side, he has a balloon amputation, and on the right side, he has a transmitted cross amputation. He ended up having neck fash on the other side. He lost his leg. So now he's got a TMA, and he has an ulcer like on the heel on that side. So now here, I'm like so worried. That's where he's pivoting off of that heel, right? If he loses that, we're done, right? I mean, there's just nothing else I can do for him. He already has a below the knee amputation. So let me go ahead and try this here. This guy has failed all those other things. Ten year history of this wound. Ten years. My failure, right? Go ahead and do that. That's to breed the wound, and then got him closed in eight TCC. Again. Why am I showing you this? Because I was the guy on the other side. I mean, I, you know, it's really, it's really, it was me. And so, so I don't want to be the failure anymore. I don't want to be the cause of that person's failure. So when I really started, or started this, it really has changed, it kind of changed me. So where can you go wrong with doing this? So one is making it too long. So you have to do this like a regular below the knee cast. If you do it too long, it'll hit the perineal nerve and you get a foot drop. Not that you'll know these people are neuropathic anyway, because you wouldn't know that they have a foot drop because they'll come in and they'll start dragging their leg, right? Um, so we want to go ahead and do that. So we don't make it too long. Um, you also don't want to make it too short. As I tell my patients, they always ask me, how come you make it so long? I said, there's only two lengths for a, for a cast. Below the knee, and above the knee, and that's about it. There's nothing else. And if you make it too low, too low and if, if, if they happen to have some kind of trauma, they can have a tibial fracture. Um, but again, there's, 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 only, there's only two lengths. Um, not covering the toes is, impo is important. These are neuropathic patients that then become a shovel, right? And things get inside there, right? They walk. Um, and, then, and, then, and then basically they you have that, all that stuff stuck inside the cast. Um, um, and then a plantar flex cast, which is the most most uh, common error. Um, you don't because if you do, if you, you what you want to do is you want to keep them at 90 degrees to reduce that pressure. If you put them in a plantar flex cast, then they're actually going to increase the pressure on the fore, on their forefoot, uh, and then it, the cast can actually crack. Um, likewise, a dirty cast, which means that they're walking without the cam boot. That boot is there as part of the healing process. It's not there in isolation. It has to be worn together with it. Um, and then not molded well. So these things need to be molded to the leg. And they also have to be changed. The first cast usually has to be changed within about four days, three, four days. And the reason is, is that just like with every other cast, these people have edema issues. When you first put their cast on their legs like this, you put that, uh, the, the regular cast on, in three days, it's like going up and down like a piston. Uh, and then you have to re then you put another cast on because now you've gotten their true leg girth. <sighs> lots of lots of evidence, lots of evidence. But the problem is nobody is doing it. Nobody is doing it. This is scary. So this was me. I was part of this evidence, right? And the reason why is that is that for the reasons that I said, it's time consuming. You don't want to put on a traditional cast. It's time consuming. It's dirty. Um, it, 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 you need three people to put the thing on. So basically, the conclusion of that paper was that if you, if you found an easier way to do it, 
then it, it would be better. So I'll tell you that, that the TCC Easy has solved that problem for me. Um, since uh, November of last year, I've put over 200 and oh, well over 200 casts on. Well over 200 casts. Um, before November, I put zero. Uh, zero. So, um, like I said, this has changed the way I'm doing, I'm doing this thing. Okay, so let's we'll make a little bit of a shift towards biologics right now again. So here's, here's, here's how I go. So I may start with that kind of a treatment. And again, I do that same gut check. If all those risk factors are addressed and corrected, but the wound's not healing at a reasonable rate, even in a total contact cast, because I'm not going to heal everybody in a total contact cast, then consider advanced wound therapy. So what we're going to talk about today is the Canadian Rocky. No. So it's basically skin cells, how skin cells, how epithelial cells like to behave, right? So epithelial cells, so imagine this is a wound, right? And the valley is that base of that wound, right? And the epithelial cells are on both sides of those mountains, right? They do not want to go into that valley to start to talk to each other, right? They want to kind of go across, right? The problem is there's this huge valley between them. So how are they going to talk about getting coffee and stuff? You know, important. Okay. So, how, how are they going to do that? So, the, 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 way, the best way to do that would actually be to, be f to fill up that valley. To bring, as I tell my patients, to bring the basement up to the first floor. And that's what we're going to talk about right now, which is Integra. Uh, show of hands, how many of you ever have seen, it, seen Integra? A few of you. In the, in the plastic surgery and wound world, um, Integra is probably the most popular um, and most well-researched wound product when it comes to biologics. This is not a new product. This is a 30-year-old product that's used in burns, um, diabetic foot, complex re reconstruction. So in our operating room, we have these, like if this is standard care for us. Um, it, has, it is a game changer because beforehand, when we talked about advanced therapies, I basically could vacuum uh, ad nauseum, right? And that's about it. And then weight continued to get a split thickness skin graft. The problem is, not everything can have a split thickness skin graft, right? Let's think about what can't have a split thickness skin graft. How about my elbow, right? If, I, if you do a split thickness skin graft, if I, a, if I, I was in a motorcycle accident and I had road rash and I had exposed tendons and I had a joint, you're going to have to figure, figure out where you're going to want to fixate me, whether I can eat or I can do toilet. Like, where would you like to, you know, me to fix that arm? And the reason is, is that it's going to get stenotic over a graft, right? That's what happens. It just doesn't move anymore because it's not regenerating the tissue. When you're doing a, a, a skin graft, that doesn't do that. Even when you're doing a muscle flap, right, you've seen that. I mean, muscle flaps are very difficult. You talk about lower leg muscle flaps and the morbidity that's associated with lower leg muscle flaps is also really, really hard. And even when you get that huge muscle flap, right, try putting a shoe on on a huge muscle flap. You can't. And you have to go into custom things and they can't walk because they have a cantaloupe that's stuck to their leg. So, so what Integra is, is it's basically a 3D lattice of collagen, um, which is also mixed with chondroitin 6 sulfate. Now, I love animals, and if there's any PETA people here, I apologize. But this is made from tendons of cows, the cow tendons that are already going to slaughter. This is not, like they're not, Integra is not killing cows. And the other thing is it's, uh, it's made from uh, shark collagen, the same way it's made, there's a collagen that's made inside there as well, a uh, shark cartilage, excuse me. And uh, in, Integra comes in different forms. The most common one is the one that you see here where it's actually sprayed on uh, a silicone sheet. And that silicone sheet actually acts as a fake epidermis and the, the bottom layer acts as dermis. So this is what it looks like when it's not, doesn't have silicone sheathing, because you can use it to pack things, and again, bring that basement up to that first floor, fill up that valley. Um, and how you apply it is you debris the wound, it has to be a fresh wound, and then it gets either stapled on or sutured on. And then when, the, when it's ready, the body basically will shed the silicone layer because the, the, the collagen gets absorbed into the body, becomes part of the body. Um, and then the wound just heals like a normal, normal wound. So if you remember the picture before where I showed you normal wound healing, 
the, here's the same wound, but instead of filling it with that clot that goes in there, we're now filling it with the Integra. And what happens is, is that the Integra does something magical, that it inhibits myofibroblasts. So what did we talk about beforehand? The myofibroblasts are what cause wound contraction. So if it inhibits that, when you heal, you actually heal with truly regenerated tissue and there's no scarring in that tissue. So you can actually see fingerprints through Integra healed skin. I'll show it to you. It's, when, I, when I first started seeing this, and I have a lot of experience, I've been doing this for 15 years already with, with this kind of a product. So it actually heals in a way where it's light replacing light, and it's true regeneration of tissue. Um, again, here's just another schematic. Here's what it looks like. It gets stapled into the wound, and then these cartoon microfibroblasts kind of come in, and, Everything's okay. Um, and then basically it starts to mature. You get something called a neodermis. It starts to mature. And then once that, once that basement is brought up to that first floor, now that zeolial cells can kind of come across and say, hey, let's go get some coffee. All right. This is my first case in clinical practice. I like showing you the first cases of stuff because I learned things from it away, around one. But this basically, I'm going to show you some salvage cases and I'll show you like real world cases. But, um, they're gross, by the way. So everybody's okay with that. These are gross. 80-year-old uh, diabetic, bilateral. This is an emergency room case. This is how I see him. This is his right foot. Um, you can kind of see that there's an abscess that's kind of coming up across the side. Um, just another few. Um, so here's what happened. They wanted, or they wanted to do a primary blow in the amputation. I said, let me go ahead and try. So what I did is I cut all that stuff up. I made a localized flap in that area. There we go. And then um, did some cultures on him, and let's go back a second. Did some cultures on him, and then basically treated the infection, right? So this was treated, there was a treated infection, uh, it was treated with an infectious disease doctor, everything got, it was fine, he had an osteomyelitis, it was a wound infection, and once everything was cleared, which was about three weeks or so, and I thought, saw the soft tissue envelope was good, I decided to bring him in and put this Integra on. So here we go, I basically, I that wound and cleaned that wound like we said beforehand, and I sutured it. This is when, in the old days when I used to suture it to the wound, and suture it to the wound here as well. And at 30 days, um, this is what I started seeing. Now this pink haze that you see on top of it, that's actually a, what's called neodermis. So those are brand new epithelial cells that are trying to migrate across that level. Okay? And this is also 30 days, this is 113 days, and then and then this is 156 days. So there's a little bit of callus that kind of went through there that we can kind of pick out. Um, but this is a salvage line. By the way, it, the same thing happened on his other leg. I just didn't show it, but he literally had the same thing on the other side. Um, and then I made, was able to make him a custom post-op shoe, custom shoe here, and he lived out the rest of his days for another eight years with both of his legs. So I said, oh, that's good. Doesn't always happen. <laughs> this is one, so, so this is one, this is a 62-year-old guy. Um, diabetic heart transplantation. So what, so, and he had a non-healing posterior heel wound for four months with exposed Achilles. Ready? Okay. So, the, the reason why this is important is, in, in most patients, this would be a, a blow to the amputation, right? The problem is, is that he's a heart transplant patient. And if you do an, an amputation on a transplant patient, specifically cardiac, what do we know about that person who has a, has a little of the amputation? Their cardiac demand and their cardiac output goes really, really high. So with a transplant patient, I'd be worried about him basically going, like going to heart failure. So saving his leg literally would be saving his life. So this has been failed for four months. It's been the vascular team at Columbia is doing a lot of work. They said, do you want to try to go ahead and do it? I said, okay, fine, so we'll try. Right? So these are all like salvage cases. So I prepare these patients beforehand. So I see things, I'm a tertiary care facility, so a lot of things kind of come towards me. Um, that that I'm, I may be their last, last ditch effort um, to go ahead and try to help these things. Um, and, and they all know it. And so I, I'm not a winner all the time, I gotta tell you. This is not, this is, it's not the case. I'm showing you things uh, more out of, um, uh, from a teaching perspective. So the reason why I'm going to show you this case is, I, I, after I cleaned it up, so we were able to clean up his tendon, these are intraoperative pictures, he also then only had half a tendon. So I had to recreate a tendon for him. So I used a, 
It's actually horse pericardium. I told you, you're going to think I like, really don't like animals. So, so the pericardium of a horse is actually really, really strong. You can actually pull a car with it. It's really, you know, they're horses. So, so I recreated an Achilles tendon for him, uh, and then bound one up for him, and then I put Integra on top of it. Um, this is what Integra looks like when you get a hematoma. Uh, but I didn't really care, I just needed something to kind of put it on top of it, and I wanted to make sure that his tendon didn't dry out, because if it desiccated, I'll be back to scratch. So I was this I allowed to do that, I took a look at it, I said, oh, that's fine. And then I backed it a little bit and then took it off. Now, the stuff that's on the side there is granulation tissue. There's even stuff, if this had, you see on the tendon itself? There is granulation tissue on the tendon. So if someone tells you you cannot granulate on top of the tendon, take a picture of it. Because you can totally manage the top of the tendon. You just have to have good, good blood flow on the sides. Now, can you put a split thickness skin graft on this? Anybody? The answer is no. Why? Because it's a joint and it's over a tendon. And first of all, there's no blood supply that's going to that area. So, and the split thickness skin grafts do not take on top of tendons. It's impossible. So our job now is to granulate on top of that. So can we do that? So that's two weeks. So here it is, it's a white foam on top of black foam because it's, um, I'm vacuuming over a tendon. This is three and a half weeks. This is 10 weeks. That's cool, huh? And then this is four months, and then I put, there was a little part there that I didn't want to wait, I was lazy, I put a half graph on. This is five and a half months. This is six years. And if you come later to see me, I'll show you the video of eight years and him actually being able to move his ankle fully, right? So, again, in an area where beforehand you wouldn't have been able to do anything else, science fiction is actually science fact. This is real stuff, and it's not something that's been around now. It's been around for 30 years. 30 years. And it hasn't changed. It's the core product there. All right, so here's the same guy, because he really loves me that much. The same guy got an animal bite on the same leg, right? I know, right? He sucks. And it's the same leg. <laughs> and they put silvidine on it, and then vascular surgeons, and this, he didn't like the silvidine. And so a nurse came and saw him, did my favorite thing ever, put collagenase on an open anterior tibial tendon. You know what happens when you put collagenase on an open tendon? It swells like this, and it starts to leak, because now it's like, greatest thing that the collagenase has ever seen. It's pure tendon. That's what it wants to eat, collagen, right? So it, and basically, his tendon turned horrible. So I debriefed a little bit, I backed him, and basically, I got him to this. So this is, again, old. so I, I was able to cover a little bit of his tendon. You can kind of see a little bit there. And what I did was, I brought, I, I, I brought him into the OR. Whoops, sorry. I brought him to the OR, and I put something called the Integra Thin Skin. We have that here. Thin skin is half the thickness of regular Integra. I didn't staple this on, I just basically put this on. Because it's so thin, the body accepts it much quicker. And if it accepts it much quicker, then if it's a very, very large wound like this is, I may want to do a split thickness skin graft quickly. So what this allows you to do if you're doing plastics is actually to do a single staged Integra split thickness skin graft over exposed tendon, right? Normally we would have to wait, like I did before. This one you don't. I still waited one week. So I vacked it. I waited a week. So the glistening, it kind of completely took. Then I put a split thickness skin graft. So it's an ultra split thickness on this one. And then I close it up. And then this is a year afterwards. So he's still not stenotic. He knows the exact same way. 73 year old. This one I pulled out for you guys here. Because it's a new, new patient with dementia who got frostbite. Went to the emergency room and they warmed him up too quick. I kind of sure have seen this, so then his foot kind of went like this. And then, then, and then after they warmed him up too quickly, his legs, his toes all went to this. So basically, his, all his toes went to cry. So they were going to do bilateral transmit parcel amputations on this guy. His, his daughter is my nurse anesthetist at the hospital and, and had him transferred over and said, Can you try to do this? I said, no, this one I really was going to work hard on. It's like my family. So I'm like, this all the time. So I said, fine. I waited for it to demarcate a little bit. And then basically cleaned it out, put that at the tips of the toes. This is at, two, this is at uh, four weeks. And we were able to basically keep all his toes. So we had everything that was there. Um, so that was, a, kind of said for, for this audience, that was a nice one to kind of put in. 
Um, this is my case of resistance because I got a lead with like the blue one, right? So, okay. So, diabetic, hypertensive, peripheral vascular disease, had angioplasties. She went to the doctor and had, she didn't know what was going on. She had a little tiny spot on her foot. And I'm going to show you a tiny spot. Swing. Can you find it? It's a thing that's right in the lateral or portion of the heel. Went to the doctor, so I, no big deal. Right? She then got admitted to the hospital. Um, for a wound which then started there. They started with antibiotics, she started feeling better, they sent her back and forth. She fell because she was having pain in her foot. They kind of she, it was a back and forth kind of trial. She gave me a five. Okay. But this is what she kind of came. This is two days before I meet her. And this is what that's looking like. And this is two days later. This is what brings her to the emergency room. So I saw this and I was like, and then they showed me that picture of where the thing started from. And I got, you know, I'm like, I cannot believe this. It's so it's so bad. This woman is going to lose her leg. And I, I didn't even, I'm going to show you that first surgery. I didn't do it. Because I thought that she would have to have a primary amputation that it was going up, like her perineals. And then if it was kind of going up there, it could be necrotizing fasciitis. So I called the vascular surgeon I work with very closely. And I said, if you want, we, um, we just take a look at it. So she went in there and basically did an extensive debridement. And it grew out some eufecalis and organella. But this is what I was left with. Right? So, yeah, and then she said, hey, Robert, can you do something with this? And I was like, <laughs> so you can see the black bone actually is where she took the bovie, so she cauterized that bone so the bone didn't bleed. So now, honestly, if I didn't see that first initial thing, I would have said no, but I looked at it and said, how can that, everything start from that one little spot? And I said, okay, so like, we'll try it. So I debrided her, I actually debrided her again, and I'm showing you the top of the foot because as a reconstructive surgeon, it, I use this like Lego. Right? So I have to take a look at and see what's working, what's not working. What's working here is the top of the foot, the skin is perfect. So I figured, okay, if I can deglove certain things, I can do a flap, I can move things down, right? There's a bunch of things I can think about. I'm going to try to save whatever I can save. So I debrided her, I put on a vac, right? And then I did the magical thing that a lot of people, doctors do is I sent her to a skilled nursing facility, which basically is like, you know, like in those old like in movies when they have like the time lapse? That's the time lapse for me. Like, I don't know what's going to happen at the nursing facility. And then they just come back a few weeks later and I see what I'm left with. So it's like, what's behind door number one? And this is what I see. And I see this is what's behind door number one. And I go, oh my God, I can do something with it. Right? Because now I have granulation tissue. So I said, okay. I went in. I've been following her at some point in time, but like, following her through there. That's me taking a picture underneath like this, right? You can see that. <laughs> so. I, I'm granulating well uh, on this thing. Uh, the heel is not that great, so I finally decided I was going to basically debride her and I was going to put on a graft. So this is what uh, I stapled on a graft on her and it is taking. This is when the integra is removed. It's taking, it's taking, and then I finally decided to put a, put, put a split thickness on her and this is what she's left with now. So, and then she walks in a post, this, I made her a custom shoe and she walks in a custom shoe. This is not new. This has been around for a while. The founder trial, which was uh, done about two years ago, and Dr. Driver will be here tomorrow or over the weekend. She's actually the PI on that trial. This has been around for a while. We wanted to say, can we replicate this in the real world? And so, um, what, and in the office setting, so not in the hospital setting. Take that technology that you can use in the, in the hospital for those crazy things that I just showed you. Why do you have to wait for them to be crazy? Why don't you do it on the ones which are easier, right? So. Trial, huge trial, so the largest CTP trial in publication. And um, again, wounds that are in the bottom of the foot, old wounds, things which have been around for a long time, then got randomized to both um, uh, standard of care and offloading versus getting a graft. Uh, wounds have been, again, a long time, plantar wounds, hard ones. These closed at a much earlier rate. They closed, um, the, the size of the, of the wound closed faster. The incidence of the complete closure was faster, um, as you'd expect, and again, the rate was, flat, was faster. Significantly faster, five weeks faster. So what does that mean, right? It's always a race when you have a wound between infection and, and closure. One of those two things is always going to happen. Five weeks is an enormous amount of time. It, I mean, I've had wounds which are this and small and turn to like horrible things like I've shown you. Five weeks is a tremendous amount of time. So these were 300 patients in this trial. So I want to show you, those were crazy ones. This is stuff that you see every day, right? Here's a patient from the trial from me. Submet 2 ulcer. 
Same thing, debrided, put the graft on, five weeks, healed at seven. I mean, this is a three month follow up on that thing. I mean, I challenge you to show me where that ulcer was originally. Right? It's the same, that's a regenerated tissue. Same thing, second, another patient, same way. Through that same thing, and this is within weeks. Closure within weeks. Okay? Old wounds. So, in, in, just to recapitulate, the TCC, take a look. The, 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 the problem is putting them on uh, takes a long time. The TCC easy makes that you shouldn't have that problem anymore. So, this is where I am. See that really big, tall building? My office is right there on the bottom. You know what's right next to me? My president. I, I, work, I work on the same block as him. Um, but, um, so, so the, I thank you very much, first of all. I appreciate you guys coming out. It's day early. Thank you very much.